fun. Hi there, I'm David Batsoffin and I host a travel blog called Travel and Things. And today I'm chatting to David Fleminger, who's an author and traveler, much like myself. And we're talking about um, a new book that he's just written. David, how are you doing? Hi, David. Lovely to see you again. I'm enjoying your COVID beard. It looks great. <laughs> I don't know why we all grew beards. You know, there was no, there was no, um, uh, what's it? What is it I'm looking for? No order that went out that said men have to grow beards. Uh, but uh, I started, I started it before COVID, and then I liked it. So I'm uh, channeling my inner Paul Krier at the moment. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe, maybe because of that, we should be talking about your um, uh, fair game, the hidden years. Um, hidden history of the Kruger National Park, seeing when Paul was in, involved in that. So, so let's take a step back in time. Tell us a bit about the book and tell us why you did it. Uh, thank you. Well, firstly, let me do a bit of product placement here and show you the book. So this is Fair Game, A Hidden History of the Kruger National Park. Uh, in fact, I've actually just uh, released a, a new version with an updated cover with an exciting elephant pick on it. Right. This is the old stock. So uh, the book, the content is the same. So uh, I wrote this book a while ago um, because I was actually asked to write a travel guide to the Kruger. And I was looking around at what's available out there. And there are plenty of books. And uh, the problem was they were all about which roads to drive down. And, you know, if you drive down this road, there's a lion who's going to be waiting for you patiently <laughs> on that corner. And if you go down that road, that's a good road for elephant or whatever the case may be. Uh, and there are game spotting guides. And that didn't really speak to me, especially after I started doing some research. And I found that the actual history behind the formation of the Kruger Park for me was much more interesting than the current where to go, what to do. So uh, I got stuck into the history and uh, from the origins from before the park was, you know, from the beginning, basically. And I was very interested to discover that the park was not a popular success. Oh. For the first 30 to 40 years. It was vehemently opposed by many different interest groups. The government didn't support it. Paul Kruger's involvement was minuscule. Um, and really, it was the effort of a, a, a self-described grumpy Scotsman named James <laughs> Stevenson Hamilton, who for 40 years was the warden of the park. And he's the one who fought for the park over and over and over again until it was finally proclaimed a national park in 1926. David, so I found... So if he was there for 40 years, how old was he when he started there? So he wasn't young when he started. Uh, oh. That's the interesting thing. He had a long career in the military in England, which he found very frustrating and limiting. He didn't like the drilling practice. He didn't like the authority figures in the top-down hierarchies. Uh, he was actually quite an interesting guy. He uh, inherited um, an estate in Scotland through his mother's family. So he was actually landed gentry in some respects. And he was a London playboy, even though he stood five foot four inches tall. <laughs> um, and he was a military man. And um, he was sent out to South Africa as part of his military um, career for uh, not the Anglo-Zulu War and another one a little bit later. Um, and he really enjoyed it. And when he came out again for the Anglo-Boer War, he was approached to stay on as warden of the Kruger National Park. And by his own admission, he said he knew nothing about the game reserve or about game or anything like that. But there was something in him that kind of said, this, this is for me. And so he went out there in the middle of nowhere in 1902. Um, he was not the first warden of the park. Uh, there were a couple of short-lived ones before that. Uh, and he really fell in love with the place. He called it his Cinderella. And he fell in love with the animals. And he was a, a voracious reader and a very good um, uh, uh, autodidact. He taught, he taught himself a lot. Mm. And he was the one who established the rest camps, who recruited the rangers, who organized the native police to clamp down on poaching uh, from the white farmers, by the way, not from the local uh, black farmers, from the white okay. farmers. Um, and he was the one who fought um, the government after government after government um, from 1902 until 1926, uh, until when the park was finally uh, proclaimed which he accomplished a very sneaky little trick, which I'll tell you about in a, in a moment. Um, but after the park was, re, uh, was proclaimed 26, he stayed on. He was going to retire in 1939, 
But then the war broke out, uh, Second World War, and he stayed on till 46. And he retired in his, I think he was about 80. Uh, I'd have to check that, but he was approximately 80 when he retired. And he died in White River, age 90. Wow. You see, everybody seems to think that because there's a statue of Um Paul um, at, an, at a gate in the Kruger, that he was the be all and end all of that park. And I was, I have to put up my hand and say, I was one of those. I mean, I know Stevenson Hamilton was there, but I didn't realize how much he'd actually done to get the park proclaimed. So, so let me tell you the story of how it actually happened. Um, I don't know if you know from Skokuza, you've got that big plaque there, Our Founders. Yes. Um, and you've got Paul Kruger or Paul, you know, at the mm. top in the center. And then you've got Piet Grobler, who was the Minister of Lands in 26. And you've got James Stevenson Hamilton. So here's how that little triumvirate worked. Stevenson Hamilton was constantly fighting for the proclamation of a national park. Um, from early on, from like within a few years of his start in like 1902, by 1904, 1905, he was already pushing for the park because the park was originally proclaimed as a hunting preserve, okay. meaning the hunters or the farmers in the Lowfeld region were complaining that all the game was being hunted and shot out. Mm. And so uh, Paul Kruger's one contribution is in 1889, I stand to be corrected, but I think that's right. 1889, uh, following these uh, petitions from the local farmers, they, they declared a small reserve, um, basically between the, uh, um, uh, what's the river that runs past Kukuza? Is that the Sabi? Yes, Sabi. it is the Sabi. Yeah. Sabi, Sabi, yeah. From the Sabi Sands River down to the Crocodile River. That was the reserve, and that was to be, they banned hunting for a time until the game stocks could recover so that they could reopen it for hunting. That was the plan. And that's all Paul Kruger did. That's it. He declared that <laughs> little reserve. Uh, he died in 1902 in exile in, in, in um, Switzerland, in Clarence in Switzerland. And that was his, he never saw the park himself personally at all. Stevenson Hamilton, after the anglo Boer War, came in and he started agitating to, for a permanent ban on hunting. As in, this must be a game reserve in the sense that we understand mm. it. Not a popular idea. Not only were the hunters cross, uh, citrus farmers wanted to get in, coal miners wanted to get in, development uh, speculators wanted to get in, Department of Settlements um, wanted to get in and use that land. And he fought them off one by one by one. Um, eventually, he was reading about the American National Park System, which says that land should be preserved, not just for now, but for future generations, for national identity, for the edification and the upliftment of the people of the country. And that was an idea he latched onto. It wasn't easy because uh, after the anglo Boer War, there was a quite a high turnover of politicians in various positions and the game reserves were moved from department to department. So he couldn't actually pin down anybody to nail it. He got Jan Smuts on board, uh, and then Jan Smuts lost power. And so it was an ongoing battle. When Jan Smuts lost power for the first time in the, in the mid-20s, he was very despairing, Stevenson Hamilton. He thought there's no way the new Afrikaner nationalist government of um, uh, D.F. Malan was going to support this, what he thought would be, was seen as a relic of the English system. And he was very concerned that they would disband the whole thing and just open it up for development and farming. So uh, he and uh, an ally, uh, H. Stratford Caldecott, who was an artist who drew posters for the Kruger Park for the South African Railways, who were running excursions that included a small strip through the Kruger. He and St uh, Stratford Caldecott were sitting together one night and they realized that the current Minister of Lands in the new government, Piet Grobler, was actually the grand nephew of Urm Paul Kruger. And they said, you know what? What about we name the park Kruger National Park? Then Piet Grobler <laughs> will push everything and make it happen. They pitched the idea to Piet Grobler. He loved the idea. And suddenly, <laughs> as Stevenson Hamilton wrote in his diary, all opposition vanished. <laughs> suddenly, everybody was on board and nobody had ever been against it. And that is what actually made the park 
be declared as a national park in 26. Um, and then it expanded and grew and developed as, as, the, as it did. But yes, uh, the actual naming of the Kruger National Park was a publicity stunt to get the government on board. And it was 40 years later that I went to visit the Kruger Park for the first time, 1966. It was my birthday present from my wow. parents. We came up uh, from Port Elizabeth by train. We went by railway uh, bus to Kruger and the bus drove you around Kruger. We stayed at Pretoria, Skop and Skakuza. And the interesting thing for me was two years ago, um, I went back to Pretoria Corp for the first time since 1966. Mm. And nothing much has changed. Nothing much has changed. That's amazing. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll follow that up uh, a little bit. So the interesting thing is when they developed the park, there was no infrastructure in the park. Stevenson Hamilton and his rangers that he recruited, uh, famous names like Harry Volata and um, um, uh, a, a variety of, of people, their ranger stations were uh, Sabi Sands, uh, Sabi Bridge, I beg, beg your pardon, mm -hmm. Sabi Bridge, uh, which is now Skakuza, Pretorius Corp, Lataba, uh, Shingwezi. All the rest camps that we have today were previously ranger stations. Okay. So there is a continuity that goes back 100 years to those rest camps and those locations. And Pretorius Corp in particular is one of the oldest and is one of the most untouched so to speak. yeah so you will see original old chalet that they built in the 20s yeah uh they, they're now museums but uh yes not much has changed <laughs> Neither of you, David. <laughs> so your the book is it is it anecdotal is it more history if people were to buy it what would they learn from the book that uh, as you mentioned in the beginning you don't want people just to open the book and go oh h2 if we go down there there's a leopard in the fourth tree from on the left because he's been he and his progeny have been there for decades exactly exactly the book is split into two sections the first and more substantial section is what i call a popular history uh which is a consistent story it's a narrative from the earliest days of kruger running up to um the kruger involvement so to speak and the the, the 80 late 1800s into Stevenson Hamilton's reign, up to the end of that, and then somewhat beyond. There are other books that have written about the more modern history of the Kruger, mm. and I wasn't going to go over that territory again. But it felt like this was a historical narrative that had not been told. So that's the first part of the book. I hope it's entertaining. It's, uh, it's easy to read. It's fun to read. I use humor in my writing because I can't help it. It's just that's how it comes out. <laughs> but it is well-researched, and it is... Um, more or less uh, accurate, I'll, I'll, I'll hazard to say. Um, and that tells you the story of how the Kruger came to be, okay. how an unwanted Cinderella became the belle of the ball, so to speak. Um, and it's got lots of interesting things about the SA Railways and about the various rangers who helped build the park and about the removal of the native inhabitants who were in the, in the park after its uh, declaration. And that's a story about you know, I'm, I'm not sure if you know, but the name Skakuza was a nickname given to Stevenson Hamilton. Mm. And it actually means he who sweeps away or scrapes clean, because he was the one okay. who removed a lot of the uh, villagers who were living mm. in the Kruger, the native uh, African villagers who were living in the Kruger at that time. So it, it, it covers all of that with a clear eye, I mm. hope. And then the second half is more of a practical, I call it a planning guide. I don't even call it a travel guide. It's a planning guide. These are the camps. These are the, this is a, a brief history about each camp. Here's some information about how to get around, some things to check out. Like I personally love the nursery at Skakuza. I mm -hmm. think it's a great place to go walking on the boardwalk uh, through the nursery. And other lesser known places that you can check out, historical sites, historical routes, like the Dock of the Bushveld route that runs from uh, Pretorius Corp down to Crocodile Bridge, yeah. which is the actual route that the transport riders actually used mm. when they were uh, transporting their goods from uh, South Africa to Maputo to uh, Delago uh, Bay slash um, Lorenzo Marx. Mm. So that whole era is also included in the, in the story, the Jock of the Bushveld era. Have you um, retold the story of Harry Walleter and uh, the Swiss Army knife? <laughs> well, it's not a Swiss Army knife. 
because the, the lovely part of that story for me is when he took the knife to England, which is where it was manufactured. And he said, you know, I killed a lion with this. Um, the guy was was quite nonplussed. And he said, yes, you know, we have sh people who, who kill sheep with it as well. You know, I seem to remember, and I may be paraphrasing it a little bit, but they were totally nonplussed by the fact that he'd, that he'd saved himself from certain death with this tiny little pocket knife that he had. You are obligated to tell the story of Harry Vomiter <laughs> and the lion. I mean, that's 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 a non it's non negotiable. Yeah. Uh, it is there, um, so it's definitely there. Again, I'm not trying to rehash stuff that's been written. Harry Vomiter mm. has written his own memoirs, which are still in print. Um, so you know, I'm not trying to uh, steal his thunder. But yes, absolutely, that particular story is there. The other thing about it is the book is split up into a lot of small, bite sized not so much chapters, but more like headings and subheadings. So it's quite okay. a good, it's quite a good book. You read a bit and then you can stop and, you know, uh, refer around and, and it's not, it's not a tome. I don't okay. like writing tomes. It is a very readable, hopefully fun to read book. As, as I, as I like to call them, it's toilet reading. You can go, you and can I pick up the that. book, take it as a compliment. You can Absolutely. pick it up. I take, you, can, <laughs> you can literally dip in and out without wasting time or, 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 you know, wondering about FOMO or anything of that sort. I, I've got to say that I have been told before that my books make excellent toilet reading and I <laughs> never take offense. <laughs> David, are there stories in that book that you, did, in inverted commas, discovered that you hadn't heard before and that hopefully you, your readers will, as you say, be entertained, informed and educated by these so that when they go to the park it's just one more thing they go all right if we turn around this corner that's the tree that the lion held uh harry walliter in that type of thing you know um so i i'm not going to flatter myself and say that there is anything groundbreaking that i have uncovered that's original right. i have spoken to people in kruger and gotten their opinions and their kind of feedback which has been folded into the book but no, I, I'm not going to say that I have, I've got breaking news that, you know, this is a blockbuster that you've never heard Gosh before. Darn. <laughs> but, but I will say this, the history of Kruger has been either very, very glossed over or misinterpreted or actively rewritten, you know, under mm -hmm. apartheid or under the old system. They didn't want a Stevenson Hamilton to be the hero of Kruger. It didn't fit their narrative. So, and they didn't want the acknowledgement of the Black Rangers and, and that kind of thing coming into the story. So as you said, the, under, the common understanding of the history of Kruger is not correct. It is either gaping with holes or it is actively misrepresented. So when I say that there is something to discover and learn and, and find out something you didn't know before, which I've had lots of comments saying, I had no idea. I've been going there for mm. years. I had no idea. It's more about... Um, taking this somewhat hidden history, which is hence the subtitle, A Hidden History of the Kruger National Park. Uh, it's, it's taking that somewhat hidden history from academic books and more obscure out of date sources and folding it into a new continuous narrative that brings these things to light again. And I think that's what it is more than anything else. Uh, it's stories and facts that you probably didn't know uh, or, or weren't fully aware of, mm. brought up and told in a modern, fresh perspective uh, so that we can look at the Kruger from with modern eyes. You know, it's interesting that I was mentioned about 1966 because it seems two things happened in, in the youth of South Africa back in those years, is that a lot of people went to Kruger and the majority of people in those days, the photographers were all shooting with Pentax cameras. It was in the days before Nikon and Canon and all the other fancy Sonys and Fujis, et cetera, et cetera. And it's amazing how many of those people who are now our age have taken their children and their grandchildren back to Kruger. If I think of somebody like um, Kate Turkington, for instance, she and her entire family, as many of them as she can fit in a minibus, um, go up every year. And I think there are between 12 and 15 of them that go to the Kruger for X length of time. And she's been doing it for years. And I think a lot of people who have a love for the bush um, started there. And I think your book will tap 
into that because what it's done is it gives people a slightly different perspective because we're all bored with the usual H2, S4, all of that type of stuff. Um, go into the park, get lost if you can, and just enjoy the trip. Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, thank you. I, I, I hope so. I actually call the book a, a, a historical safari because to me, that's what it is. Uh, instead of hunting animals, which you can, which you will do anyway, yeah. this directs you say, take this road. This is the road that Jock was written along or that Jock takes place on. Uh, go and check out this historical marker. In Skakuza, go check out this old Rondavel that is dates back from the 1920s when they first started. Um, and it gives physical locations to stories so that you can, you can basically lay a historical uh, level on mm. top of your game in the <clears throat> safari. Uh, and it's great for uh, reading in the Kruger because it does take you back to those days when things were wild and untamed. And I have quoted quite extensively from Stevenson Hamilton's various writings because he wrote a lot uh, on the Kruger and on nature in general. And he was a very good writer. He was had a very dry sense of humor. And so he has described his routine, his daily routine, which I've quoted in the book, and I've uh, quoted excerpts from his diaries, um, which, in, which show his personality and his sense of humor and his determination. He was a stubborn little man, <laughs> let me tell you. It's, at five uh, four, so yes, I can it's very him. much a compliment <clears throat> to, uh, I, to I a, can... a body. I can well imagine him. You said he was five foot four and he had a commission in the army. Um, I can imagine him on a parade ground with his, uh, with his swagger sticks uh, stuck under his arm, screaming at people who were probably six foot plus and getting the job done. Well, as a matter of fact, so in the beginning, in his early days, he secured a commission in the cavalry, which is what you did if you were in the land of gentry. Uh, but he was basically, um, he was not high ranking. He hated the drilling practice. He hated the rain in England. He hated stomping up and down fields for hours at a time. He just hated it. Uh, <laughs> he really excelled when he was left on his own, uh, which is what happened here. And actually during World War I, he was seconded away from the Kruger and went to rejoin his regiment. And he served with honor in Gallipoli. Uh, okay. He also, uh, after Gallipoli, went to the Sudan where he received his promotion to Lieutenant Colonel, which was his, uh, his, his was Lieutenant Colonel James Stevenson mm -hmm. Hamilton after the Sudan. And then uh, after a couple of years in the Sudan, uh, he actually missed Kruger and he applied to come back. But yes, I think he was a man not to be taken lightly. <laughs> and he writes in his, he writes in his diary one of the, uh, after one of the setbacks he had with one of the government departments when he was rebuffed. And he was rebuffed a lot. For 20 years, he was rebuffed. <laughs> He said, I began to administer, I, I began to discover a hitherto unsuspected strain of obstinacy. <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know how unsuspected it was, but yes, I, I, he was, you know, once he dug his heels in and set his sights on something, yeah. didn't let it go. David, tell us where is the book, uh, give us the name of the, the book again, where is it available, how can people uh, get it, um, was it self-published? Uh, it was self-published uh, under my own imprint, which I have called Dog Dog Publishing. Um, it was self-published, and I'll tell you why, just between you, me, and, and the, the wider audience. Uh, I was initially commissioned to write the book, as I mentioned at the beginning, by a publisher. And uh, they were expecting a drive down the H1-2 and find <laughs> Leopard in <laughs> number seven. Uh, and I didn't write that. I, that's not the book I wrote. I wrote something else. And they said, no. We don't think it's going to sell. And so they basically left the book in my hand. Mm -hmm. And I tried to submit it to a couple of other publishers over the years. And I kept revising it and just polishing it a little bit here and there. And I thought, you know what? Things have changed. Production has changed. It is now possible for me to print myself, promote myself, use online facilities. So I published it myself. And it's actually done quite nicely for me. Uh, it's, a, it's a constant seller. The book is available in the Kruger Park shops. If it's not, please let me know so I can nag them to stock it again. But this is the book, Fair Game, A Hidden History of the Kruger National Park. It is available on my website, davidfleminger.co.za. Uh, That's Fleminger, F-L-E-M-I-N-G-E-R, .co.za. It is also available on takealot.com. And it is available as a Kindle ebook on Amazon 
and as a print on demand on Amazon as well, if you live overseas. So uh, it is quite widely available. I must just ask you a question that, that, that I ask of the majority of, of authors that I interview or have interviewed over the years. You walk into the shop at Skakuza, your book is on the shelf. Do you stand in front of the book and in a loud voice proclaim, oh, look, it's a book by David Fleminger. I must buy this for my collection. That's, that, is not, that is A. B, do you go, oh, look, it's my book, but it's side on. I'm going to move it so that it is face on and it is right near a till or C, both of the above, and you scream loudly as you get thrown out of the shop. It's my book. I wrote and published it. Okay, so, so uh, full confession, I do turn the book from the spine <laughs> out to the cover out. That I, abso I absolutely do do that. <laughs> I don't stand there going, ooh, I wonder who this David Fleminger guy is. That, that I don't do. Uh, but I will always check if it's in stock, how many copies they've got, and if it's displayed nicely. That, that, that I will do before I'm thrown out of the show. <laughs> David, it's been wonderful chatting to you. Thank you so much for taking the time. The book, once again, Fair Game, The Hidden History of the Kruger National Park. As David said, it's available either via his uh, website, David Fleminger. Um, you can find it there or take a lot um, or as an e-book e on Kindle. I like that print by demand. You can say, can, will, will you sign it if it's print by demand? Can I tell you the truth? I have never seen a print by demand copy from <laughs> Amazon. I've never seen a physical copy. My cousins in Canada have got one, yeah. but I've literally never actually held the Amazon print on demand book in my hands. <laughs> but if you order it from my website, you will definitely get it signed. Great stuff. David, thank you once again for chatting to us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, David.